Yes. Okay, now. Uh, hi, this is API Days Helsinki again, and we have a speaker from Okta, Andy March. Welcome to kind of this virtual Helsinki. Pleasure to have you here. And you are talking about um, something to do with identity, but before I let you loose, uh, can you share a life hack of like, what have you learned or and what do you want to share about these weird times we are living in? Um, so something I've taken to doing every day is taking 20 minutes at the very start of my day to read anything but the news. Um, just 20 minutes, cup of coffee by myself. And after that's done, then the world can start. Uh, it just gives me that little bit of space in terms of getting up and getting going before reality hits in. That is good. That is very, very similar to what I heard from Alan from IBM. It seems that we are all kind of trying too much in this time of, of crisis and forgot to keep those small moments of peace. But hey, now everybody in the audience, relax and, and take it away, Andy. Thank you very much, Shannon Starclots. Hello and welcome to Identity as Code. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about user identity how you should consider it during the design of your applications, how to build it safely, and how you can test it without driving yourself mad. The landscape for digital identity has changed dramatically in just the last few years. Developers must now consider multi-factor authentication or the federation of social media accounts. And as we'll see during this talk, that adds more complexity to an already difficult subject. So I'm Andy Much, and I work for Okta as a senior platform specialist, which means I spend my time helping developers build better identity into their applications. I've worked in secure systems in a range of languages and technologies for the last 10 years, working on everything from fighter planes to e-passports to customer loyalty programs. So information wants to be free. Why do we even care who is accessing our services? Why not let anyone? interact with our service, do so. Data.police.uk is a fantastic example of a service that doesn't require any authentication to access. The data they provide is public record, and this service just makes it easier for developers to consume that, integrate it into their services with a really low barrier of entry. But there's still identity. You're still identified, there is a rate limit that is enforced to protect that service from abuse. This is the much lesser known full version of the quote. Information wants to be free, but information also wants to be expensive. What about information that is not for the public good, that we don't want to spread as widely as we can? For many applications, what you can see and what you can do depends entirely on who you claim to be. If you're not logged in, I want to show you promo pages. I want you to advertise my product. If you're logged in as a user, you can interact with the app, do whatever it is I've built that app to do. And then if I've logged you in as an admin, I might let you control other users, add and remove people, manage how you pay for the system. Getting this behavior right is critical. If you get it wrong, you might not charge a user for your service, or you might grant them access to something they shouldn't see and probably end up as front page news as a result. So let's look at an example of how this can go wrong. As a new grad, I was asked to test the behavior of a very large hierarchical RBAC system, role-based access control. Every user in the system had a role which governed what information they should and shouldn't be able to see. And we needed a lot of users in this system. And I wasn't gonna roll these by hand, so hey, I'm a developer, I can write a script, and it'll create users randomly and assign them a role. Uh, that, that's fine, you do a few hundred, yeah, that's fine, but test data's boring. So what makes it more fun? Superheroes. So we set to work with our new army of test users, Private Batman, Major Superman, and Colonel Thor. And this is how it should look. Private Batman reports to Major so Superman, who reports to Colonel Thor. Superman can see all the data from all the privates who report to him, and Thor can see all the, datas, the data from all the majors who report to him. Looks good. Except this outputted as one massive unordered XML file with thousands of users. So we weren't gonna sit there and manually check all this was correct. 
and when I was a new developer, my script had a bug in it. And it duplicated the user ID of a few of the test accounts. So Batman actually ended up reporting to Batman who reported to Batman. So combine that with unique user IDs in the application and the fact we'd made the role field be able to accept multiple values, Batman now had every single permission in the system. When we ran the tests, they all passed, green lights on the traffic board, right, we're good to ship. We only found this bug when we did a trial with real users and people reported they had too much information cluttering their screens and it was getting in the way. At this point, we realized that everyone could access all the information for any account within the system. There's no motivation to fix a bug like an angry kernel demanding why everyone can see his privates. How could we have solved this? Better tests would have caught the problem. If I hadn't written buggy test code, we'd have caught it in development. We wouldn't have shipped buggy code. But if we hadn't have written the code in the first place, it wouldn't have been an issue. General identity is a solved problem. Standards have already been written, which you can use wholesale or as building blocks to handle your user's application identity. These standards come with guardrails and tooling that you can use to guide you. They've been analyzed, hammered on, patched, in some case broken, by experts from all over the world who've provided input on a wide variety of perspectives and use cases to help make those secure systems. Whatever you have built yourself has not had that level of scrutiny and therefore by default will be worse. Open standards such as OAuth and OpenID give you a fantastic basis from which to build your application identity. These are well supported both with open source and vendor libraries that make it easier to build out uh, in whatever language and technology stack you choose to use. But these are not silver bullets. No solution is perfect. Even if you follow these standards, you need to be careful how you implement them. Facebook was bitten a few years ago by a bug in the view profile as feature that allowed you to harvest the access tokens of your friends as you viewed your profile as them. Now, this is a misimplementation. There are clear leading practices to address the known issues with these standards. You can't say the same about that login process that you've just devised. Now that we've got a firm basis on which to stand, we need to look at the piece we do control, our application. How each component of your architecture views its users is critical. If the process to test user behavior is onerous, then you either end up with blind spots in your test or very fragile tests that break as soon as any user facing policy is changed. As we break our old monoliths up and aim to build a more service architect based architecture, we get a much clearer view of how identity is used in the application. Here, I'm breaking user identity out into its own service. This is the service responsible for everything to do with how to authenticate and authorize the user. But do all components need that same view of the user? My business logic doesn't actually care how the user are authenticated, just that they are authenticated. My database layer doesn't care whether it was Alice or Bob who authenticated, just that they have a set of permissions that allows them to carry out an action. By drawing clear boundaries, we have an excellent opportunity to reduce the complexity of creating the test users in this scenario and test discrete functionality, which only needs parts of that user's identity. And this is an issue I often see after. Yeah, we're going to run our CI tests on every commit, and that's going to hit you with several thousand logins at once. Okay, fine. Um, but why do all your test users need a full session? As our architecture is now able to be subdivided based on the view of the user that is needed, we should be able to test within that boundary. My business logic should be able to perform an action just given the user object without needing that user to actually log in. And the basic principle of a unit test is that we should be testing within the smallest possible boundary at any given time. When that test reaches a boundary, we should be mocking off the behavior of the outside world so it's predictable and repeatable. A simple way to think about this is we must validate what we expect to happen in the outside world actually happens, capture that behavior, and use that capture to build our mocks and tests. Later on at an integration layer, we may want to attach a test to that outside system so that we can fail if the behavior of that system changes and breaks our assumption. So let's take a look at an example, MFA. 
Multi-factor auth is something I see more and more devs try to test as it gets rolled out into customer applications. I've seen inventive approaches to doing this, email listeners for one-time codes, a full OTP generator registered during test setup is still my favorite. Um, but let's look at what we're actually trying to validate during our test. When our user sends the login, what we're actually validating is that the page behaves as expected um, when an MFA response is required, that it can gather the right input and send the right response back, and that it only lets the user through after it's told to. We never actually validate the password or even the MFA response. You know, we might check it's the right length, contains the right characters, but we're never checking its correctness. By treating our auth as an architectural component, we're making the mocking of the entire system on the right-hand side much easier. But there are going to be times that you need to reach over that boundary just this once to get a test condition to work. Yeah, that happens for everyone. In these situations, it's important to have a pattern to address that in a way that doesn't block your tests and doesn't stress what is outside that boundary. Wherever you have these externally interactive tests, you should define what that dependency is clearly in hopefully a single place. Initialize that resource once and reuse that resource within your test. And then when you've finished, make sure you go back and clean up whatever it is you've touched outside your boundary, because there's nothing worse than a test that fails because test user one already exists. So what we've discussed so far works really well in isolation. But as we push up the deployment pipeline, we go through a number of steps which handle these tests differently. Development, this is fine. You know, we're working inside our boundary, you know, mostly in unit tests. As we push to our CI service, now we might be in a shared environment, tests with other components. As we go to QA, this is production alike, and we're running some potentially really complicated tests here. And then finally, when we get to production, production users will do things that no one's ever expected. There are four environments there in a really simple example. How do you handle the complexity of change management in your identity system? If I'm manually configuring my identity policy, I'm dependent on maintaining the consistency of that setup everywhere where the code can be run. What happens when we change the password policy in production? If passwords must now all be a minimum of 10 characters, does that policy flow down so that all the tests in dev are set up to handle that policy? Or will those tests fail the first time they, hand, they encounter a production-like environment? With our application infrastructure, we can manage that configuration complexity using infrastructure as code. With this approach, you don't manually spin up instances and install your application. You write a script that defines how many instances of your application you want, what their dependencies are, and how they're configured. I'm going to use Terraform as my example here. Other providers are available, but Terraform fits nicely in that vendor neutral orchestration sweet spot. Using Terraform, we can take our application config, define it in a plain text file, and run a set of commands that configure our resources in AWS or GCP. As we extend that down into the identity layer, we can treat our identity service the same as any other part of our application infrastructure. We can now define our application's authentication and authorization logic as code and ensure we get the same behavior across all of those environments. And because they're plain text files, we're storing them in source control. So regardless of if it's production or a developer's local environment, we can point to one definitive source of truth as to what identity means within our application at any given point in time. And this has the added benefit that you know, we're treating it as code. We treat it the same way we would any other piece of code. We can scrutinize it as a team, make sure that any changes we have make sense and they go through a code review process that we're probably already using. So let's look at an example. We have an amazing new application. It's got a front and a back end already defined in Terraform. I'm going to define our identity provider define a group that um, talks about our developers and create a custom attribute on our profile schema that tells us what roles you know, individuals should have within our own application. I can define a policy that forces a particular MFA type for my developers and ensures they're prompted for this you know, every time they create a new session. I can define our standard OAuth authorization server 
and give it a scope of tabulate, which allows us to define an action on our API. In our application Terraform, we register our components against the identity provider and set which OAuth grant types our application will be requesting. And that allows us to generate the credentials those applications need silently, no more going and speaking to an admin to, can you create me a client ID, client secret pair? And then we push this out to production. We've got an environment file that defines the specifics of production, and we can now generate this environment programmatically in a repeatable way. If we lose a you know, application server, we can redefine it. If we want to update our policies, we can, we can change those files in our source control, push those changes out to production. When we grow, we need a QA environment with a slightly different variable file. We can configure that resource identically to production. I mean, that's a rare site, a QA environment that actually matches production. So we've got consistency of environment, but what do we do about the users? We can treat our test users as any other resource. We can define these in a Terraform file and uh, state their attributes and know exactly what structure and state they will be in when they're created. In our, in our QA environment, we can conditionally add this additional file and know that our users will be created when that Terraform script is run. Once we're done with testing, we can simply call Terraform Destroy, burn everything to the ground, and know with absolute certainty we've restored the environment to a clean state from which we can test again. To summarize, um, use the standards that already exist. They probably solve more than you need today, but they will save you from a lot of pain tomorrow when those requirements change. Consider how the different parts of your system view users and architect, architect those structures accordingly. Your tests will thank you for that. Those tests will stay more easily with inside the boundaries when you give them a defined structure that makes sense to them. But you should know you will need to reach outside those boundaries every now and again, but just have a plan for that and you know, follow that. Whenever possible, define as much of your environment as code as you can. This will mean that you have a single source of truth for what identity means to your system at any given point in time, and that everyone working on that system can go to there to verify their expectations. Thank you very much for your time today, everyone, and um, stay safe. Thank you for your presentation. It was really a, a really good eye-opening presentation. and and. Um, I would just have one question. How do you see, like, do people even understand what identity is versus authentication? Like, let's start from the pretty basics, uh, because I think that's the, the kind of key thing to understand why you should have identity as a code in the first place. Yeah, certainly. Um, so if I jump back to, let's find a mouse. If I jump back to this architecture diagram back here, do, 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 do. yeah. So you'll see there, I've actually split that user identity subservice into yep. so auth n and auth z. Those are really the two building blocks of user identity. User authentication, can I prove you are who you say you are? Mm -hmm. And user authorization, okay, I, you know, I don't, if I know who you are, do I actually want to let you do the thing? Yeah. So those are two very fundamental parts of user identity. I can verify you are who you say you are, but you may not be allowed to do the thing that I want you to, that you're requesting the permission to do. Yeah, this is exactly the kind of holy trinity of the whole thing, but they are very often confused. And my question is actually that um, kind of, how do you see this identity playing out? Does it actually matter for the identity as a code uh, paradigm to like, if you actually do know who the person is there, like the real physical person, or is it just kind of like identity is based on, let's say, email address, and you kind of just identify that email address there, because this is also the kind of ongoing <laughs> discussion oftentimes where this starts. Yeah, absolutely. And we're seeing a lot, um, a lot of change in the space of mm -hmm. identity verification. So depending on the system I'm interacting with, do I care who you are? as a physical human being and in what context do I care or do I even want to know? So mm -hmm. when you 
reach up and start touching citizen ID use cases, that becomes really critical. I need to verify you are yeah. who you are. Um, we're seeing this a lot with healthcare solutions at the moment, given the current environment. Mm -hmm. Are you authorized to access certain healthcare material? Do I, what documentation and what proof do I need to go through mm -hmm. to get you to the point that I'm happy you are who you say you are? You mm -hmm. are a medical professional, so you have access to the following materials. You are a member of the general public. Okay, we might have a much lower barrier of, in, of entry mm -hmm. for that because what we're authorizing you to is a much lower um, severity. So okay, we yeah. want to make this information generally available. Do we need to authenticate the user at all? Yeah, we might just want to make that publicly available where if we have a researcher, we might want to validate their credentials to a level much higher than that of the general public because we're going to give them sensitive numbers around infection rate, for example. Mm. Um, yeah, so there, there's the identity and then kind of the authorization is almost built in to the identity. Uh, there, but sorry to ask these kind of very simple questions because I do see the kind of much more robust value of, of um, treating the identity as a code and kind of automating things. But if you are not even clear of what is the identity <laughs> that you are trying to kind of verify here, then then you're kind of in trouble, and that is where the buck stops, so to speak. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You, you have yeah. to know what, how you expect to identify that user before you can automate yeah. that. And, and of course, here are the API users and API using identities is even more of an issue because there is often this federation type of situation. How do you see that as part of the identity as code? So where you have um, third party APIs talking to your service, mm. API is, it's just a different type of user. Mm. So you have a user interface, which is designed for you know, a human being sitting in front of a machine. An API is an application programming interface. It's the same thing, but for a different type of user. And that's always the best way I find of describing that because ident the identity in that case is Okay, how do I want to identify this machine that is going to authenticate mm. to my system? Do they need to be a trusted party? Do they need or are they able to publicly enroll over the internet? What information do I need to protect this service from abuse? So we saw the data.police.uk example. Um, there, it's just, hey, you're hitting me from this IP address. You know, get yeah. over this limit and we'll cut you off. Exactly. But of course, sometimes you need to also kind of know that, okay, this is the API or this is like the software that is calling our service, but this is then kind of doing it on behalf of a specific user. And, and then it starts to get complicated. It also starts to get complicated on the testing side of things because then you have a lot of other things to consider. But hey, I think that uh, this covers the, the topic. I mean, there was like the very basics, but, but you, you went ahead to the advanced level. And, and I think that everybody should understand these points that you made and, and definitely um, not implement their own <laughs> identity services, because this is where I see a lot of problems and a lot of failures, even adopting APIs that, that use their own identities or don't care about the identities too much. Thank you. And see you hopefully uh, on site in Helsinki <laughs> some year. Absolutely. I'd love to. Great. Thank you. Bye. Good to see you.